Ahoy, hello, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name is Dan. This has to be the greatest podcast in the history of the universe. I have won not one, but two prizes for the greatest show that's ever existed. We have done that, and we're entering this podcast for the third just need to get our entry done in time so we can send it off to the prize ceremony that's up in Neptune, I think, this year. Now, this week, we'll catch up with Techno Mum. She's still trying to win all the prizes in the Tech Trivia Game Show. This week, it's all about durability. What's a career where you'd be thinking about durability? Well, what about a console games tester? Did you know that there are people who are paid to test every part of them? Engineers call the area quality assurance. Some will check the game itself to check for bugs, but others will test the consoles to make sure they can stand up to hours of play. Also, you can hear about a way you can help one of the most beautiful creatures in the world. 50% of the UK's butterflies are now at risk of extinction so that's quite worrying and quite conserving so that's you know that's half of them um but there's plenty that you know you can do to help reverse these these sad declines and and i've got your questions to answer as always this week they are on lost cities and storm names it's all on the way as we search the science secrets around the solar system in a brand new fun kids science weekly Let's kick things off with this week's science in the news. Japanese police can't figure out why wild monkeys have been attacking people. Over 40 people have been injured in the last few weeks in Yamaguchi City. The police say it's been done by Japanese macaques, but no one can figure out why it's happening or, which is even worse, how to stop them. And China has launched the second of three modules for its space station. The first was sent last year, and they're going to use these modules to build the Tiangong space station. Hopefully, by the end of this year, it will be ready for astronauts. And finally, a huge swarm of jellyfish has surrounded a boat near Israel. Local experts say that their boats were looking at the water nearby during the annual jellyfish migration. These jellyfish were moving to a new home and surrounded the boat. And scientists say that pollution means jellyfish are swarming more often and in larger numbers. Let's check in with Professor Hallux now. This is from his Dental Depository series. Hallux, the professor, he's one of our favourite geniuses on the show. He and Nurse Nanobot are sorting out what's going on in your body, why you get ill and how you can get better again. Now, in this series, he's celebrating his uncle Halitosis' 100th birthday by answering loads of questions of what's going on in your mouth and what effect sugar and things like that have on plaque. Professor Halix's Digital Dental Depository with support from Philip Sonicare. <laughs> to honour great uncle Halitosis, dentist extraordinaire, on the occasion of his 100th birthday, Professor Halix is creating a pop-up digital dental depository, an oral health help desk. He's going to see how many questions all about teeth he can answer against the clock. We're getting to the root of the matter today, Nanobot. All the questions are about teeth. That's a pearly idea. OK, here goes. What are teeth? Great question. Well, obviously the prime purpose of teeth is to help us eat food. They also, though, help us smile and talk. Teeth might look smooth and white, but there's a lot going on under the surface. The outer coating, the part you can see, is called the crown, and it's coated in tough enamel which acts like a shield. Well, it has to be when you'll be chomping through as many as 100,000 meals over your lifetime. The next layer is dentin. This is a softer material than enamel and acts as the last line of defence for the squidgy pulp where the nerve endings and blood supply run. It's these sensitive parts that cause toothache when a tooth has been injured. And then there's the root that anchors the tooth to the jaw. As the root is not protected by enamel, if it gets infected, it needs immediate attention by a dentist. Cracking start, Hallux. Next question coming. Why do teeth look 
different to each other? Well, that's an easy one. It's because they do different jobs. The teeth at the front of your mouth have a sharp edge. They're called incisors. And their job is to slice and cut. Great for biting into apples. Your canine teeth sit next to your incisors. They have got a point to them, literally. The pointed tip is to help tear tough foods like meat. Towards the back of your mouth, you'll find your premolars and molars. These are flatter, bumpy teeth which help grind up lumpy food like grains and seeds. And then hidden at the back, often under the gum, are your wisdom teeth. These are large and have a similar role to the molars. They're left over from prehistoric times when our diet would have included a lot more rough stuff. Another great answer. Right, next question. What are baby teeth and why do they fall out? A baby's head and jaw is very small. There isn't enough room for adult teeth. Baby or milk teeth are temporary teeth which appear when babies are around six months old. You have 20 baby teeth, 10 on each jaw. They stay with you until you're around six or seven when they start to fall out to be replaced by 32 adult teeth which have been quietly growing under the surface. All your adult teeth should be in place by the time you're 14, except for your wisdom teeth, which may appear any time from late teenage or not at all. And if you're lucky, the tooth fairy will give you some pennies. Just don't forget to put the tooth under your pillow at night. That's correct. And time's up. Brilliant, Professor. Very respectable score there and lots of data for our digital dental depository. Professor Halix's Digital Dental Depository, with support from Philip Sonicare. Find out more at funkislive.com slash Halix. Let's get to your questions then. I love this part of the show. I think you probably do too, because you get to learn so much about the questions that you ask me. And I get to do the digging to figure them out. All that you need to do to get involved, leave your question as a review on the Fun Kids Science Weekly's page on Apple Podcast. Simon has done that. He is first this week. He wants to know, is the lost city of Atlantis real? Have you heard about this? It's a mythical city meant to be full of riches and it has been lost lost people think under the ocean and hundreds of people have searched for it over the last the hundreds of years really people have tried to say where they think it could be and then they've gone looking for it they've tried to map it but they've never found anything and scientists today think that it was never there at all Now, it was first written down over 2,000 years ago in 360 BC by the famous philosopher Plato, which is why people thought this lost city was near Greece. Now, experts think that he actually made the place up uh, in one of his stories as a warning of what happens if you're too rich because it was a place full of selfish, horrible people and that it was never even there, Simon. Thank you for the question. Also this week from someone anonymous, they haven't left their name. If you are going to leave a question as a review on Apple Podcasts, make sure you write your name so I can say hello. They want to know, how do people name storms? Now, it's done by the World Meteorological Organization, Meteorological, it's quite a tongue twister. They're like the weather forecasters of the planet. And uh, the storms are named in alphabetical order and they switch between male and then female names and they do it in a six year cycle. So after six years, they'll go back to A and start thinking of more male and female names that they can switch between. Thank you for the question. If there's something you would like answered on this show, on the Fun Kids Science Weekly next week, leave it as a review for me, please, over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, how can you help save one of the most beautiful creatures in the world? Let's find out with Dr. Zoe Randall, who is Senior Surveys Officer at the Butterfly Conservation. It's come around again. She's got some big news to share. Zoe, thank you for being there. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. No worries at all. Every year I love chatting to you because the big butterfly count is back. 
That's right. It's back. It's uh, it started on the 15th of July and it runs all the way through to the 7th of August. And we want loads of you to get out there and count the butterflies in your garden. It's really, really easy. You just need to spend 15 minutes in a warm, sunny spot counting the butterflies and, you know, the different types uh, uh, that you see. And um, we've got an ID chart, which you can download from the bigbutterflycount.org website and there's also an ID guide in the Big Butterfly Count um, free smartphone app so it's a real doddle really easy for you to do and get involved and help save and count butterflies. Now there's a lot going on in the world at the moment and I know that's the same across many many different creatures quite a lot of them are at risk and their numbers are dwindling out. Uh, What's happening with butterflies? How at risk are they at the moment? Well, recently we published some work that said that 50% of the UK's butterflies are now at risk of extinction. So that's quite worrying and quite conserving. So that's, you know, that's half of them. Um, But there's plenty that, you know, you can do to help reverse these, these sad declines. And one of the things which will make you feel better about, you know, what's going on is to take part in the big butterfly count. Because doing the big butterfly count, it makes you feel happy and and chirpy because you're sat out in the fresh air and you're counting the butterflies getting some sunshine enjoying seeing them flitting around flying around and maybe having the odd mid-air squabble quite often you can see two male butterflies and they'll be circling around each other and they'll sort of spiral up into the air and that's them fighting for territory so it's really good because it helps you feel good because you're doing something positive to count butterflies and save them and it's good because you're out in the fresh air, relaxing, unwinding and, and just watching the, you know, watching the butterflies do their thing. So what's happening with the butterflies right now? Why are almost half of the species in the UK at risk? Well, there's lots of reasons. One of them is is there's lots of demands for land. So um, there's lots of human beings and we all need places to live. So there's competition for, for land. So butterflies are being shoved out and there's, you know, places, the number of places that they can live is getting fewer and fewer. Um, there's also, um, you know, changes in the countryside as well with the way that uh, the countryside is managed because, you know, we, it's, we've got a lot of industrial, industrial um, agriculture going going on out there and so agricultural practices aren't very good either for butterflies Um, and also then we've got climate change as well you know and we know how uncomfortable climate change can be for us with the with the heat that we've been experiencing recently and then there's other things like floods and and all of that and that's also having an effect on butterflies some you know some butterflies are, are benefiting from climate change because as our climate warms they can move further north um um, in, in the UK, so they can move northwards up the country and into Scotland, um, whereas other ones, um, the climate change isn't helping them very much at all because they like it nice and cool. And if our, you know, if it gets, if the temperatures get too warm, then then the butterflies, um, you know, that they, they don't like it. Um, and and there's only so far north, so far north they can go. Once they get to the end of end of Scotland, so once they get to um, John O'Groats, where can they go? <laughs> Now, we're always hearing uh, about how important bees are for the world. They're extraordinary pollinators. A lot of the food that we eat on our plate, bees have had a huge impact. So it's very important to save the bees. What are butterflies doing? I know that they look stunning, uh, but how important are they for the ecosystem that we know? Well, there's a growing body of evidence that shows that butterflies and moths are really important um, pollinators as well. So they're probably just as important as the bees, although the bees get all the all the attention, uh, you know divas, bee divas, they get all the attention. But I like to think as moths in particular, as the bees of the nighttime, because they're busy um, pollinating plants in our gardens, you know, at night when we're in bed, tucked up asleep and stuff. So we don't see them doing what they're doing, but they are just as important. And also, um, butterflies and moths as well are important in the food chain. Lots of other creatures eat the caterpillars of butterflies and, and moths. So birds eat the caterpillars of, of, of 
of moths and butterflies and lots of other like small mammals eat them too and other insects and then there's also the fact that butterflies and moths are eaten by birds so quite often you know you can see um, a butterfly or a day flying moth will be flapping around minding its own business and a hungry bird will come along and pomp and grab it out of the snatch it out of the sky uh, and eat it and dragonflies as well do the same so really important pollinators really important food in the food chain as well and also because we've studied them so much over 300 years in in the uk um, they're really important indicators of environmental change so they're like um they're like a barometer you know if things aren't looking good for butterflies and moths then the chances are things aren't looking good for other creatures and that includes ourselves you know that includes human beings now you've got until the 7th of august if you want to if, if we want to make sure zoe that we are finding a butterfly is there anywhere we can look that they particularly like well, Buddleia is um, is known as the butterfly bush, and if you've got a Buddleia in your garden, then that's a good place to start. Um, so you can look. Um, so and any other flowers really, butterflies love nectar. It's you know it's what they it's what they uh, it's what they 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 feed on. It's what they get all their energy from to fly around and, and find mates and then and lay their eggs. So any nectar sources. So brambles and Buddleia and valerian, all kinds of flowers and you can do the big butterfly count anywhere you like you can do it in your garden you can do it in your local park or out in the countryside anywhere you like um so yeah just get out there 15 minutes in the sunshine and count the butterflies you see and don't forget if you don't see any butterflies it's important that you let us know that as well so you can submit a a, a nil return so a, a count of no butterflies There we go. So you've got until the 7th of August. Not that long, but enough time. It just takes 15 minutes. Get yourself outside. See which ones you can spot. Dr. Zoe, thank you so much for telling us all about it. If you want to find out more, get to bigbutterflycount.org, right? That's right. And yeah, and you can also download the free mobile phone smartphone Big Butterfly Count app too. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we're going big, we are going huge, we're going to the biggest thing that we know in the universe. We're looking at the largest star we've ever found. It's got the catchy name of Stevenson 218. It is a red supergiant in the constellation Scutum, and it's 18,900 light years away from us, which means that light from that star takes almost 19,000 years for it to get to Earth. Now, Stevenson 218 is over 2,000 times bigger than the sun. Its volume, the amount of stuff in it, is more than 10 billion times bigger than the size of the sun. To put that in perspective, think about Saturn for a second. Saturn is the sixth furthest planet from the sun. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. So it's quite far away. Now, picture its orbit as it goes around our sun. This star, Stevenson 218, is so big, it's as large as that orbit around the sun and it's about 3000 degrees in heat as well and all those numbers that extreme heat means the red supergiant stevenson 218 star shoots straight to the top of our dangerous dan list let's catch up with techno mum now she's taking part in a brilliant new quiz show We've heard some of the rounds in the last few weeks. It's testing her knowledge about some of the most brilliant tech discoveries, how they came about, who found them, and why they're here in this week's episode. It's all about durability. Techno Mums Tech Trivia with the Institution of Engineering Technology. Welcome back to Tech Trivia, the game show that tests the technical talents of our tremendous contestants. And playing this week, it's Techno Mom! Hi, I can't believe I'm still here. Well, you've played the course so far, but can you keep it up? Let's find out and spin the wheel. And today's category is durability. Your time starts now. Your first question is in two parts. What is durability and why is it important in technology? Hmm, 
Durability is about how well something will last. Engineers need their products to be durable because those products have a job to do and they have to be able to do it without breaking. And that's super important where safety is involved, like medical implants that help keep people alive, and where it's hard to get replacements or repairs like in space or in the middle of the oceans. That said, even everyday items need to be durable because it can be expensive, not to mention annoying, to have to keep buying replacements or get things repaired. As well as choosing the materials and design carefully, another way that things can be made to last is by future-proofing them. This means making sure they're using new technologies which are expected to be around for a while or can easily be upgraded. Next question. What's a career where you'd be thinking about durability? Well, what about a console games tester? Did you know that there are people who are paid to test every part of them? Engineers call the area quality assurance. Some will check the game itself to check for bugs, but others will test the consoles to make sure they can stand up to hours of play. Sometimes machines are used to press the buttons thousands of times because you get a pretty sore finger doing that yourself. Nice answer. And last question. Name a cool innovation which helps products to be durable. Well, graphene is pretty amazing. It's a very new material which is created in a laboratory. Made from carbon that's only one atom thick, it's the strongest material in the world. It's incredibly thin and flexible, but unbelievably tough. Engineers are excited about this stuff because it will help make simple items very durable indeed. For example, at the moment, touchscreens on mobile phones and tablets use glass, and we all know how easily they can crack and shatter and how annoying that is. Graphene could be used with plastic to make screens that won't break. Well, your winning streak shows no sign of being broken. You're through to the next round, Techno Mum. Great, you could say I'm almost as durable as graphene. Techno Mum's Tech Trivia with the Institution of Engineering Technology. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash tech trivia. And that is it for the Fun Kids Science Weekly. If you have something science that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it as a review over on Apple Podcasts. Next week, we'll talk all about the James Webb Space Telescope and the pictures that it's taken of the oldest stars in the universe. Now, you can listen to loads of brilliant podcasts that we make on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. They're on the free Fun Kids app as well. And you can listen to Fun Kids. We are a children's radio station all around the UK on your DB Digital Radio on that free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com.